Hey guys, welcome to Found Flicks and another edition of Ending Explained. Today we'll be looking at the 2011 spooky found footage film Grave Encounters, where a TV crew gets more than they bargained for in a haunted asylum, as so many of you requested. But first, it's time for you guys to vote for the next Ending Explained. The first choice is American Psycho, where yuppie Patrick Bateman's increasing bloodlust causes him to become a serial killer. And then we have M. Night Shyamalan's The Visit, where two kids go to visit their estranged grandparents, leading to you guessed it, a twist ending. So make sure you vote on which one you want to see next. Now let's move on to Grave Encounters, which isn't just the name of the movie, but also the show at the center of the story adding an odd meta element to things which is taken to a further extreme in its sequel. Similar to countless other ghost hunting reality shows, Grave Encounters features an extra douchey host Lance, who along with his crew Sasha, TC, Psychic Houston, and Matt, trek around to supposedly haunted locations around the country in order to catch paranormal activity. Problem is, none of them are actually haunted, and the show is 100% fake. That is until the filming of episode 6, The Haunted Asylum, where the crew went missing and was never heard from again. Yet somehow their raw footage made it to the outside world where the show's producer edited it into the film we are watching, allowing us to find out what happened to the crew at Collingwood Mental Hospital. When they first arrive, we get some major foreshadowing to the crew's fate when Lance interviews a local town historian learning of the asylum's disturbing history. First opened in 1893, Collingwood came into being in an attempt to prevent further overcrowding at hospitals nearby. Back then, mental hospitals were more like a dumping ground for patients patients rather than a place for them to get real help of any kind. The conditions of the hospital were also terrible with the patients not having blankets, clothes, or even food. And as if the conditions weren't bad enough, the hospital was run by Dr. Arthur Friedkin, a major proponent of lobotomies, and he used the patients at the hospital as subjects for his experiments. This came to an end in 1948 when a patient escaped and stabbed Friedkin to death. With the hospital's dark past, it's no wonder that the spirits that are still there are at unrest and, well, pretty angry. And that is the basic gist of the movie's story. The camera crew become unwilling patients at the hospital exposed to the same experiences as those in the past, where the only ways out of the hospital are to be cured by lobotomy or death. At this point, the crew is unaware of this and believes Collingwood is not really haunted, and even scoff as they approach the front door seeing death awaits written there, thinking it's too cheesy to even use in the show. If only they knew. Once inside, they speak with a few others who tell them of other ghostly encounters they've had there over the years. And based on reports of people being pushed, stabbed, and thrown, Lance believes that the haunting isn't a residual haunting, which is like an echo of the past repeating over and over, but is an intelligent haunting, where there are actual spirits who react and have intention. The crew begin to set up a bunch of cameras at paranormal hotspots around the hospital and then go into lockdown, having the groundskeeper lock them inside the building who according to their plan will arrive at 6 a.m. the next morning to let them out. The mood is jovial amongst the crew at first as they don't have anything to fear yet. And when Sasha uses a tape recorder to try and catch EVP or voices of the dead that can be caught on tape recordings, when they play it back no one answers her questions. But after about four and a half hours of recording time, we get our first sign of the spirits that still reside in the hospital. At one of the paranormal hotspots, Static momentarily takes over the camera image and the window opens by itself. Things get a bit more intense when TC on his own enters a bathroom, first noting that it's very cold inside. Then the door slams closed on its own. Understandably freaked out, he returns to the others showing them the footage and they are actually impressed because for the first time, they have potential proof of the afterlife on camera. Hoping to see it happen again, they set off back into the corridors, where after a while, Sasha's hair is tousled by something unseen. Now having concrete paranormal activity caught on camera, Lance is desperate to keep filming and takes a picture, which we see after later being developed is full of spirits, as seen by orbs floating all around the area. Urged on by TC to go home, Lance finally relents, feeling they have enough footage, and decide to pack up their equipment and leave. They then when they return to base camp, we see the beginning indications of yet another layer of difficulties for the crew. They remark that it's already 6.15 when they come back, so the caretaker should have returned to open the doors to let them out by now. But time moves differently within the hospital walls, not at the same speed as outside. And even though they are at the hospital only one night, the producer at the beginning remarked that the tapes contained over 70 hours of footage. So obviously the hospital exists in its own time and space. And beyond time, 
time, the hospital's physical structure can also be manipulated with the walls themselves moving positions. This is first discovered when Lance and TC break their way through a set of doors, finding themselves on the other side of the doors outside. The ones marked death awaits. These should be on the outside of the building, but clearly the structure has been shifting around at various times since they've been in there. And this is to represent that escape is impossible for a mental patient. They are doomed to their fate inside the hospital. We also see this physical change occur when they attempt to track down a fire escape, but at the top of the staircase is only a brick wall no door to freedom. You can't simply walk out of the hospital. That isn't an option until you have been cured. That's why they literally are unable to get out of the hospital. They are now essentially patients at Collingwood forced to cope with the same conditions as those in the 1800s. And it appears the spirit's attempt is to drive the crew insane with fear before they are considered acceptable to be taken for experiments. Because they could just swoop them all up or kill them right off the bat, but they choose not to and slowly increase the intensity of the hauntings until they finally do appear. And we see the crew become increasingly on edge as their stay in the hospital goes on and the encounters become more dangerous. After 46 hours inside, the crew goes in search of the missing Matt. And just as they're about to give up their search, they see what looks like Matt running behind them. They chase after him entering a room, finding a woman in a gown standing in the corner. She turns around, her face contorting into a demonic and ghostly visage, and they run off hiding in a closet nearby. During this, somehow Houston gets separated, now finding himself alone and in complete darkness. He slowly makes his way down the hall as an ominous low rumbling rings out and Houston is lifted into the air being strangled. It lets him go and he calls out for help as a big flash of light appears, launching Houston down the hall, killing him, now motionless lying on the floor. If we equate this to the fate of a mental patient, Houston was apparently killed by another patient, one who no doubt had been pumped full of drugs and experimented on by Friedkin, causing him to turn violent. Unaware of Houston's fate, Lance starts breaking down, unsure of how much longer they will last. They wake up later, discovering they each have patients' wristbands with their names on them. And now that they have their own wristbands, their patient initiation is nearly complete. Still desperately hoping to find a way out, they head back into the ever-changing corridors, and at one point Sasha is attacked by an arm emerging from a door, and the others get her free, running away. But Sasha is overwhelmed with fear, and stops unable to go on anymore. Up ahead, TC calls them over, and it's the missing Matt sitting alone, now dressed in a hospital gown. When they try to communicate with him, he seems in a daze, starting to ramble about his symptoms as a patient. It's clear that in his time away from the group, he has gone through what the patients did and is greatly affected by what has happened to him. They say he must know a way out, and Matt responds, of course there's a way out. We can all leave when we're better. So we're seeing that concept further clarified via Matt, that there is no other way out other than going through with treatment at the hands of Dr. Friedkin, telling them everything will be okay and he will help you too. Well, that doesn't exactly sound reassuring to be honest. And it looks like there really is no other option if these guys ever want to get out. The hospital is working against them in every way imaginable. After passing out again, they are woken by Sasha screaming and hands all over the room and ceiling, reaching out and grabbing at them while the camera goes staticky. They make it to another paranormal hotspot, a room where a woman drowned herself in a bathtub. Matt starts getting closer and TC tries to pull him back, but a girl emerges from the blood grabbing TC, causing the tub to spill over and suddenly both the woman and TC have vanished, leaving Matt laughing insanely. Back in the halls, they come across an elevator, but they can't get the doors open. So Lance tells Sasha to stay behind with Matt while he looks for something to get the doors open. He comes across a bed, pulling a bar off of it, and then discovering a bloody tongue on the floor. And he looks up, seeing a man in a gown on the ceiling who utters Lance. He makes it back to the elevator doors, getting them open, but just as he's about to climb down the shaft, gets distracted by odd noises nearby. He switches his camera to night vision, and the man appears in the hall, lunging at Lance and attacking him. They managed to get the man trapped behind a door, but I'm not sure how long that will hold him back. Meanwhile, Matt takes a camera, then walks into the elevator shaft, tumbling down to the bottom dead. For Matt, even though he had begun his treatment, he had been tortured and changed by the experience. 
and had lost all hope, and thusly he commits suicide. The only other alternative to ending the torture. The final survivors, Lance and Sasha, take the ladder down the shaft, finding themselves in the tunnels beneath the hospital. These tunnels are the only paths that connect to the other buildings on the grounds, and thusly is their last chance of making it out. But of course, the hospital's physical state is constantly changing, and so the tunnel they take is unbelievably long, stretching eternally onwards. And at one point, when taking a break as Sasha is getting increasingly ill, coughing up blood, they say they have been walking for an entire day in one direction, because there literally is no end. The hospital is changing itself to prevent them from ever getting anywhere. We witness our most mysterious character fate as the two lay in the hall, and a fog appears growing in size. Once it dissipates, Sasha has disappeared, leaving Lance all on his own. Yeah, so what the heck is that about? My best guess is the idea of the fog representing mental fog, the idea of a mind mentally degrading into insanity. As the mental fog takes over Lance, Sasha disappears as reality has become clouded in his mind. Again, Lance sits on the wall using the tape recorder, asking the spirits what they want. When he plays the recording back this time, we hear countless voices screaming out and calling for help, and Lance breaks down crying. So he continues down the eternal hallway, hearing more voices in the walls calling out to him, and Lance starts laughing to himself, having clearly lost his marbles at this point. He tells them to come and get him, only to pass out once again on the wall. And when he awakens this time, a door has appeared in front of him. Well, that's probably not going to lead anywhere good, but where the heck else is he gonna go? So he opens it, going inside, revealing that he has found himself in Dr. Friedkin's office, seeing diagrams of a brain and various pictures of patients cut open. Exploring further, he stumbles upon a ritualistic looking area with a strange symbol on the bottom and a pulpit. He flips through a book on top of the pulpit and it's written in an ancient looking language. It must be that Dr. Friedkin was mixing his lobotomy experiments on the patients along with a healthy dose of witchcraft. We don't ever discover what his end game was, but it seems like he was using the patient's bodies as some sort of satanic ritual. And it has to be due to the use of black magic from the book that causes the doctor and patient spirits to remain in our realm and explains his powers over the hospital itself, able to bend its time and space. Lance then spins around, seeing the spirits of Dr. Friedkin and some nurses have suddenly appeared behind him. Uh-oh, looks like it's his turn on the table. Lance screams out. I'm not crazy, he yells, and we hear a thud, followed by more screams. In our final scene, Lance reappears, talking to the camera post-lobotomy, talking with slurred speech. He says he's all better now and can finally go home, giving his signature outro. For Grave Encounters, this is Lance Preston signing off. So Lance suffers the same fate as the other patients who were at the hospital in the past. Again, the only way out is to be cured or die. In the end, Lance gets a lobotomy, which does mean that he is technically cured, and when we learn more about the fate of Lance in Grave Encounters 2, we find out he wasn't in fact allowed to leave. But that's a whole other video, so let me know if you guys want me to do an explain for the sequel as well. Alright guys, that'll do it for my ending explain on Grave Encounters. In a nutshell, a TV show crew enters into a spirit-filled asylum and unwittingly find themselves trapped inside living through the horrific experience of mental patients in the past at the hands of satanic worshipping lobotomy obsessed Dr. Friedkin. Oh, and as far as who sent the tapes to the producer in the first place, it was the ghosts. Yep, somehow the ghosts are able to send packages in the mail. This isn't really touched on in part one, but part two makes it clear that it is the ghost sending out the tapes in hopes of luring people to the hospital to get more patients for Friedkin's experiments. Okay folks, we are approaching the site of the encounter that the lady had in this house, which she described as super duper spooky. Right beyond this door, maybe we'll see something inside. Oh, brr, oh my God, you guys, it just got super chilly in here. A surefire sign that ghosts are afoot. Let me see if I can contact any spirit bros. Hello? Is there anybody there? How are you today? How are you today? Nothing. Which is odd, because I thought there was for sure a ghost here. I think it was coming from this closet over here. But there's no way in hell I'm gonna open that thing. I guess we gotta open the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, it's a real ghost! Oh, oh it's punching me! Oh. 
and cut. <laughs> How was that, guys? Was that believable? That oh, looked pretty yeah. good, right? Yeah. What did you guys think of Grave Encounters and its ending? Are there any other movies or TV endings you want me to do explains on? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.